the United Nations Security Council is an elite grouping of the world's most important and powerful nations. It has the power to make decisions that are binding on all UN member states. Its five permanent members are the United States, Russia, formerly the USSR, the United Kingdom, France and China. They have the power to block, to veto any resolution proposed in the Security Council. This gives the permanent members enormous influence over the actions of the UN as they can prevent the adoption of any resolution that they see as being against their interests. Since 2014, Prime Minister Modi has been actively pursuing a permanent seat for India on the UN Security Council. He is seeking what Prime Minister Nehru rejected and gave to China. Here's what happened. The United Nations was formed in 1945 at the end of World War II. The five permanent members of the original Security Council were the United States, the USSR, France, the UK, and the Republic of China. The Republic of China was one of the victorious allies of the Second World War. In 1945, at the end of the Second World War, the Chinese Civil War resumed, and by 1949, Mao Zedong's Chinese Communist Party had prevailed. On October 1, 1949, Mao Zedong proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China in Beijing. Nearly all of mainland China was soon under its control, and the Republic of China ROC government retreated to the island of Taiwan, where it still remains. So the ROC government became mostly irrelevant on the global stage, but it continued to retain veto power in the United Nations Security Council. This was problematic and not sustainable. Clearly, another nation would need to replace the ROC at the United Nations Security Council. That nation would need to have a global stature. The simplest solution was to replace the ROC with Mao Zedong's People's Republic of China, the PRC. But the US did not want to help a communist nation ascend to the pinnacle of the global order. They wanted a democratic nation to replace the Republic of China. The USSR was also also wary of Mao Zedong's People's Republic of China. So both superpowers, the US and the USSR, seem to have compromised and agreed upon India. The US offered India a permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council in August 1950. Mr. Nehru's response was astonishing. He said that that would be very bad from every point of view. We shall go on pressing for China's admission in the UN and the Security Council. We are not going in at the cost of China. In his book, Nehru, the Invention of India, the former United Nations Under Secretary General Shashi Tharoor writes that the Americans made another offer in 1953. Mr. Nehru again urged that it be offered to Beijing instead. Two years later, in 1955, the Soviet Premier Nikolai Bulganin offered India a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. Mr. Nehru rejected the Soviet offer and insisted that priority be given to China's admission to the United Nations and its ascension to a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. On September 27, 1955, when the issue was raised in Parliament, Mr. Nehru categorically denied any offer, formal or informal, having been received about a seat for India in the United Nations Security Council. But offers were clearly made. There is ample evidence from multiple credible sources, including Mr. Tharoor, who happens to greatly admire Mr. Nehru. So was Mr. Nehru economical with the truth and that too on the floor of India's parliament? Why did Mr. Nehru reject multiple opportunities to make India a permanent elite veto-wielding member of the UN Security Council? To try and understand this, we need to examine Mr. Nehru's record as leader and prime minister and see whether this was a one-off event, an uncharacteristic lapse, or whether this was part of a larger pattern. So let's examine Mr. Nehru's career and actions from the year 1946 onwards. By 1946, Britain's exit plan for India was clear. They intended to partition India and create an artificial nation called Pakistan out of Indian territory. The British occupiers held provincial elections in India in 1946, in which only 13% of the eligible adult population was allowed 
to vote. This was not a democratic election by any stretch of the imagination. This was an illegitimate election whose purpose was to set the stage for partitioning India and handing over power to Jinnah in Pakistan and to the Indian National Congress in whatever was left of India. With the Congress party winning over 900 seats in this election, it became clear that whoever became the president of the Indian National Congress in 1946 would also go on to become India's first prime minister. On April 29, 1946, Sardar Patel was elected unopposed with a margin of 12 to 0. Mr. Gandhi asked Mr. Patel to withdraw his nomination. Mr. Patel obeyed and did as he was told. Mr. Gandhi then had several Congress Working Committee members propose Mr. Nehru's name. It's interesting to note that Mr. Gandhi had resigned from the primary membership of the Congress party back in 1934 and was therefore not even a member of the party. And yet he managed to overrule and overturn the 12 to 0 mandate of the Pradesh Congress committees. And that's how the unpopular Mr. Nehru, who did not earn a single nomination, became the Congress president and later the first Prime Minister of India. On June 7, 1947, Mr. Nehru discussed the Mountbatten plan to partition India with Mr. Jinnah and Mr. Mountbatten. A week later, on 15th June 1947, under Mr. Nehru's leadership, the Congress party voted in favour of India's partition. The people of India were not consulted. On August 14, 1947, the dominion of Pakistan was carved out of Indian territory. The next day, India became a British dominion with King George VI as its head of state. Mr. Nehru single-handedly created the Kashmir issue, the Kashmir dispute, which should never have been a dispute. Jammu and Kashmir's ruler, Maharaja Hari Singh, offered his kingdom's accession to India in July 1947, in September 1947, and on October 21, 1947, but Mr. Nehru refused each time. Mr. Nehru refused Jammu and Kashmir's accession to India an incredible three times. There was no provision for the Indian government to refuse a princely state's accession to India. And yet Mr. Nehru did just that. By late October 1947, Pakistan had invaded Jammu and Kashmir and their forces were almost on the outskirts of Srinagar. Finally, Mountbatten and not Mr. Nehru accepted the instrument of accession signed on October 26, 1947. The Home Minister, Mr. Patel, was finally allowed to intervene and he sent the Indian Army to Kashmir and prevented Pakistan from taking over Srinagar and the rest of Jammu and Kashmir. The accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India was unconditional. The Maharaja signed the exact same document that every other princely state signed. And yet Mr. Nehru decided that the circumstances of Jammu and Kashmir's accession to India were special. This was a special case and he decided that the accession would be conditional to the wishes of the people of the state. Mr. Nehru then internationalized this issue by taking it to the United Nations and by committing the government of India to the holding of a plebiscite in Kashmir. By late 1948, the Indian army was on the verge of recapturing Muzaffarabad. Mr. Nehru ordered the Indian army to suspend all offensive operations with effect from January 1, 1949, even though the Pakistanis did not stop fighting. This is how Pakistan-occupied Kashmir came into existence and remains in existence. The Kashmir issue was single-handedly created by Mr. Nehru. The region of Kalat lies at the heart of Balochistan. Just like Maharaja Hari Singh of Jammu and Kashmir, the last Khan of Kalat, Mir Ahmadiyar Khan, wanted to accede to India. This became public knowledge on March 27, 1948, when V.P. Menon, then Secretary to the Government of India, gave a press conference on All India Radio and said that the Khan of Kalat was pressing India to accept Kalat's accession, but India would have nothing to do with it. The Pakistani government heard about this and that very same day, on Jinnah's orders, the Pakistani army invaded the independent state of Balochistan and forcibly annexed it 
to Pakistan. The Khan of Kalat was taken to Karachi and forced to sign the instrument of accession to Pakistan. This was the beginning of Pakistan's brutal and oppressive and exploitative occupation of Balochistan, which still continues. And that's how Balochistan became a part of Pakistan instead of India, thanks to Mr. Nehru. The port of Gwadar is situated less than 200 kilometers from the port of Chabahar in Iranian Balochistan, in which India has a strategic interest and a significant stake. Gwadar was given as a gift to Oman by the then Khan of Kalat in the last quarter of the 18th century. After 1947, Gwadar was administered by India on behalf of the Sultan of Oman because the two nations enjoyed excellent relations. The two nations still enjoy excellent relations. In 1948, the Sultan of Oman offered Gwadar to India. Prime Minister Nehru refused the offer on the grounds that India could not defend Gwadar from Pakistan. Oman eventually sold Gwadar to Pakistan for $3 million. Gwadar has now become a Chinese strategic asset. In 1948, India had one of the most powerful, advanced and battle-hardened navies in the entire world. India had at least 78 warships and around 20,000 naval personnel. The Indian Navy's incredible firepower had enabled the British to rule the Indian Ocean unchallenged from the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf to the Strait of Malacca east of the Bay of Bengal. India did not lack the ability to defend Gwadar. If East Pakistan and West Pakistan could exist as a single nation despite being 1700 kilometers apart, Gwadar could certainly exist securely as a part of India. If the Falkland Islands could remain under British control despite being over 12,000 kilometers from Britain, Gwadar could certainly exist securely as a part of India. What was lacking was Mr. Nehru's political will and vision for a stronger India. In 1947, the ruler of Hyderabad, the Nizam Mir Osman Ali Khan, declared independence from India. His 200,000 strong paramilitary force, the Razakars, unleashed horrific atrocities on the Hindu populace of Hyderabad. Home Minister Sardar Patel wanted to take direct military action to liberate Hyderabad. Mr. Nehru, though, wanted to take the Kashmir route and take the matter to the United Nations. Mr. Nehru humiliated Mr. Patel in a cabinet meeting and called him a complete communalist. Mr. Patel never attended a cabinet meeting again. Nevertheless, in September 1948, Mr. Patel launched Operation Polo, a police action that liberated Hyderabad in just five days. Mir Osman Ali Khan was removed from power but allowed to keep all his personal wealth as well as his title. Mr. Nehru maintained friendly relations with him. Imagine if Mr. Patel had allowed Mr. Nehru to take the Hyderabad matter to the United Nations. Hyderabad would be another Kashmir today. The Koko Islands is a group of three islands that forms the northernmost portion of the Andaman Archipelago in the Bay of Bengal. These islands have historically never been a part of Burma. They have never had a Burmese presence on them before 1948. These islands were part of British India, the British Raj, and they were administered by British officials from Burma, which was a province of British India from 1882 to 1937. In 1937, the British separated Burma province from British India and began administering it separately. In 1947, the Andaman Islands and the Nicobar Islands became part of India, but the Koko Islands did not. Not because Burma wanted them, but because Britain wanted to deny India these islands. The British imperialists had no business or legal basis deciding what happened to these islands. India could have simply incorporated the islands into the Andaman and Nicobar Islands territory, and there was nothing the British would have done about it. Mr. Nehru chose not to do anything about this. He gifted the Koko Islands to Burma in 1948. Today, these islands host a major Chinese electronic spying station that eavesdrops on Indian activity in the Bay of Bengal and threatens India's national security. Thanks to Mr. Nehru. 
The Kabo Valley is a 11,000 plus square kilometer highland valley on the Indo-Burmese border that is sandwiched between Manipur and Burma. It is extremely fertile and is well known for its wood products like teak. This valley has historically belonged to the Kingdom of Manipur. This fact was confirmed through the Treaty of Yundabun, which was signed in 1825. The Kabo Valley was leased to Burma in 1834. It was given on lease. According to an agreement signed that year, the Kingdom of Manipur was to be paid a monthly sum of 500 rupees by the British for leasing the Kabo Valley to Burma. The treaty also stipulated that this monthly payment would cease only when the Kabo Valley was handed back to Manipur. Manipur gained independence from the British in 1947 and merged into the Union of India in 1949. Burma stopped paying the lease for the Kabo Valley in 1949 and with Mr. Nehru's consent, annexed the valley. Mr. Nehru generously gifted an immense and resource-rich Indian territory to Burma without consulting the people of Manipur, the inhabitants of the valley or the parliament of India, as if the valley was his own personal property. The Chinese invasion of Tibet, which began in 1950, ended with the annexation of Tibet in 1951. This culminated in the 1962 war between India and China, which has been portrayed as the great Chinese betrayal. Mr. Nehru called it a stab in the back with great pain and anguish. In his 2018 book, Will Tibet Ever Find Her Soul Again? The French-born historian and journalist Claude Arpi has made an explosive revelation. Mr. Nehru's government supplied rice to the invading Chinese troops in Tibet when they were busy invading this nation in 1950 and 1951. Mr. Arpi writes that the most grotesque incident of this period was the feeding of the PLA troops with rice coming from India. Without Delhi's active support, the Chinese troops would not have been able to survive in Tibet. Imagine that Mr. Nehru, for reasons best known only to him, actively helped the Chinese invade and conquer Tibet, and then claimed that the Chinese had betrayed and backstabbed India. This set the stage for what would happen in 1962. In the early 1950s, the Nepalese king Tribhuvan Bir Bikram Shah had offered to merge Nepal with India. He wanted Nepal to be a province of India. Mr. Nehru rejected the Nepalese offer. The former president of India, Mr. Pranab Mukherjee, wrote in chapter 11 of his memoir, The Presidential Years 2012 to 2017, that Mr. Nehru rejected the offer on the grounds that Nepal was an independent nation and must remain so. Had Mrs. Indira Gandhi been in her father Mr. Nehru's place, she would have perhaps seized upon the opportunity like she did with Sikkim. King Tribhuvan's offer was a golden opportunity to reintegrate Nepal into the motherland, India. Mr. Nehru rejected it, and today China is attempting to use Nepal as a means of gaining a foothold in the Indian subcontinent. In 1956, five years after they annexed Tibet, the Chinese started constructing a military highway through the Indian territory of Aksai Chin. Construction of the 1,200-kilometer road lasted from March 1956 until completion in October 1957. Mr. Nehru's government did not even learn of the road's existence until September 1957. In July 1958, the existence of the highway was confirmed by published Chinese maps, which not only showed the new route, but also placed all of Aksai Chin in Chinese territory. That same month, in July, the government of India sent an initial protest to Beijing and also sent two patrols to reconnoiter the road. The two patrols were detained by the Chinese for one month. This was the beginning of a sequence of events that would eventually culminate in the 1962 war with China. This happened because of Mr. Nehru's incredible neglect of critically sensitive border areas. Which is all the more surprising considering the fact that the Chinese had just invaded and occupied Tibet. In 1960, Mr. Nehru signed the Indus Waters Treaty, which gives Pakistan control and ownership of 80% of the waters of the Indus River and its tributaries. 
This is probably the most unequal and lopsided treaty in history. A larger nation with a huge population gave up 80% of the water of rivers that pass through its territory to an enemy nation. Why did Mr. Nehru agree to such terms? Nations have negotiated better terms even after losing wars. Who did Mr. Nehru serve? India or Pakistan? Edwina Mountbatten, who was a close friend of Mr. Nehru, died on February 21, 1960. In accordance with her wishes, she was to be buried at sea. As a way of paying tribute to his friend, the grief-stricken Mr. Nehru sent the Indian Navy's warship INS Trishul as an escort to her funeral and had a wreath cast in her memory. Now, one understands that Mr. Nehru would be distraught and would want to pay tribute to his friend, but using an Indian warship for personal matters was clearly extremely inappropriate. Mr. Nehru seems to have had a proclivity for treating Indian assets and territories as his own personal property. In the early 1960s, before the 1962 India-China War, US President John F. Kennedy offered to help India detonate a nuclear device. President Kennedy felt that democratic India and not communist China should become the first Asian country to conduct a nuclear test. Mr. Kennedy's letter emphasized that nothing is more important than national security. Mr. Nehru, for reasons best known to him, rebuffed the offer. If Mr. Nehru had accepted the offer, India would have become the first Asian nation to conduct a nuclear test before China. This would have deterred China from launching its war of 1962. This would also have deterred Pakistan from launching its war on India in 1965. Had Mr. Nehru accepted the US offer, India would have been a founding member of the nuclear suppliers group and would not have been left out the way it currently is. On October 20, 1962, the Chinese People's Liberation Army launched two attacks on India, a thousand kilometers apart. One was in Aksai Chin and the other was in Arunachal Pradesh. This war would continue until November 21 that year and ended in a Chinese victory. The reasons for India's defeat are discussed in detail in Brigadier John Dalvey's book Himalayan Blunder and Rajnikanth Puranik's book Nehru's 97 Major Blunders. Let me give just two examples. The Indian Army lacked equipment for mountain warfare. It lacked weaponry and basic essentials like warm clothing, snow boots and glasses all under the watch of Mr. Nehru's government. And Mr. Nehru's most glaring blunder was not allowing the Indian Air Force to be used in an offensive role. Mr. Nehru only allowed helicopters and transport aircraft to be deployed in limited roles. Who benefited from this? China, obviously. The responsibility for India's defeat in the 1962 war with China lies squarely with Mr. Nehru. In 1963, the year after China invaded India, Mr. Nehru appointed his sister Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit to lead India's delegation to the UN General Assembly in New York. In a news conference there, she declared that India would continue to support China's admission to the United Nations despite China's unprovoked aggression against India. She said that it was a matter of principle and had nothing to do with the relations between India and China. One wonders what principle compelled Mr. Nehru and his government to support an enemy nation and promote its interests at the expense of India's interests. Mr. Nehru sadly passed away on May 27, 1964. He was known for being disturbed and filled with unease at Hindu temples in southern India. He was known for portraying India as a nation of snake charmers to foreign dignitaries. And he was known for giving an interview to Playboy magazine in 1963, the year after the Chinese debacle. What we have covered is merely a brief highlights reel of Mr. Nehru's actions and achievements as Prime Minister of India. There's a lot that I've not covered because it would take too much time. But it's clear that Mr. Nehru's rejection of multiple opportunities for India to become a permanent veto-wielding member of the UN Security Council was not a one-off event. Although his decision to deny India 
the permanent veto wielding membership of the UN Security Council has no logical explanation. It was clearly part of a much larger consistent pattern of actions from 1946 all the way to 1964 that repeatedly and consistently hurt India's national interests, strengthened India's adversaries such as Pakistan and China at India's expense, eroded India's global geopolitical stature and created essentially every single problem that India faces today. The Nehruvian years were India's lost years. India's immense potential was wasted. Opportunities that come by once in a century were squandered. That is Prime Minister Nehru's legacy. As Prime Minister of India, Mr. Nehru was duty-bound to serve India and her people. He was duty-bound to prioritize India's national interests over those of other nations. Did he do that? Who did Mr. Nehru serve? through his actions. Intentions don't matter. Words don't matter. The only thing that matters is actions and the consequences of those actions. Were Mr. Nehru's actions beneficial for India or were they beneficial for someone else? You must judge. You must decide. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching.